So what questions do you have up there in your mind or thoughts that keep like reappearing in your head? <laughs> And Dan says, another important consideration, parent access to student records is addressed by FERPA. And the thing that, one of the things that I think is important for parents to know is um, FERPA allows the school district to take 45 days to release the records. Um, my understanding, California, I think it's still this way, California requires after a parent's made a request within 10 days, the school district has to provide the records. Um, so depending on what state you live in, I mean, if you want educational records and you're waiting 45 days, that's like a long time. Um, so depending on what you're asking the records for, Sometimes I'll just have parents ask for the last three years. Um, if down the road they want to do a due process, they can only go back two years. But I just start with like the last three years because otherwise, depending on how old your child is, you can have lots of boxes of papers. Um, the other point is in IDEA, it doesn't say you get copies of the records. It says that they have to pull all the records together and be able to let you look through them. Um, most places will give you copies if you can get it, you know, like on a thumb drive, that's even more helpful to me, um, you know, that you can download it that way instead of having lots of hard copies. But um, you just want to also know that in IDEA, it when the section, and Dan can probably look this up for us, <laughs> this section that talks about um, access to records, if you have an upcoming like IEP meeting or mediation, Laura, <laughs> or a facilitated meeting or something, that IDEA has that exception that you can get the records before the meeting um, and not have to wait 45 days. So the template that I use for families um, that are working with me kind of goes into, yes, we know there's a 45 day, you know, grace period from FERPA, but we also know IDEA says blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's the thing. Um, the other thing about records are emails. If it mentions your child, if it mentions you, those are considered educational records. You can request copies of those. The template that I have, um, is from a uh, very famous attorney out East. And she lists 28 different items that are considered educational records. So she gave me permission to use her letter. So now I use that as a template, but yeah, there's a lot of specific things that you kind of sometimes forget about. And if you only put a generic request for records, you're probably not gonna get very much. Um, so again, the word of the day is specific. <laughs> um, be specific in your request of what you want. Um, and Lisa says, the thing is the art of seeing a specific child's strengths, needs, and incorporating that into access points in the scaffolding. It's just so hard, especially if you're unsure you believe full inclusion is possible. Um, and it is hard, I think, when you're doing it by yourself. Um, it can be more challenging, but um, I don't know. I to me, it's kind of a fun thing to do is to figure out once, you know, I mean, you have to have a good picture of the student, right? And the whole picture of the student. Um, but I, I love figuring out how we can use this piece here to help over here. Um, so accommodations, I think a lot of times we think of what are the environmental barriers 
and we need to have an accommodation to, you know, remove that barrier. So that can be one way when you're looking at what would be good accommodations for my child to have. The other part that I like to look at, and so when I'm color coding that IEP and highlighting all the strengths in green, as I go back to that and I say, this is, the, these are strengths for the child. This is how they learn, right? Um, how can I use this and use it as an accommodation? So a real easy example is for students that are visual learners, like my son was a visual learner. Um, and so then a great accommodation is a daily visual schedule on his desk, right? Um, and so looking at your child's strengths and saying, how can we embed these into that accommodation section? So again, to me, that helps the IEP be more strength-based. Um, and we want that to be that common thread besides inclusive education that goes through the IEP, that it's strength-based. Um, the other thing is, so if you guys don't get my weekly newsletter and you're interested, let me know because I'll put more resources in there. Um, so the one I was just thinking of is one of Shelly Moore's previous videos where she talks about um, goals and instead of being M for measurable, it's M for meaningful. Um, and that's like a wonderful paradigm shift that would be great is, you know, how are kids really gonna use this? And so I, I don't know if you guys know Kathy Snow, she wrote the book, um, Disability is Natural. She and I lived like a mile apart from each other in this little town in Colorado for years. And Kathy and I would have all kinds of conversations at the local Wendy's at night. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we would talk about is how to make these goals meaningful. And so I was looking at a student that I had um, when I was a teacher, and one of the things that he was working on was handwriting, you know, to write smaller, to write legible, all those good things. Um, and instead of having a measurable goal that, you know, he's going to write his first and last name on this kind of paper or whatever, it's like, where in the school does he need to use this skill of writing his name? So one place is on worksheets, right? If you, you know, students have like a written paper, usually they have to put their name on it. Um, and then we're going, okay, so where else in the school do you have to be able to write your name? Now, this is gonna tell you <laughs> how old I am because at this point, <laughs> We were going to a library that in our building that still had library cards. Raise your hand if you remember library cards. Um, and students would have to, there's a whole can of pencils there, would have to write their name on the library card in order to check out the book. I know we don't have to do that anymore, but <laughs> the whole idea was to kind of do this ecological inventory of the school environment and say, where are real life situations when this child has to do this skill? And let's have that be the measurement that, you know, that we're going to be looking at that skill um, and how it's going to be used. Not like, you know, if they can take, you know, three conversation turns with the SLP in the therapy room. Um, we want to move away from those kinds of goals, I think, and be more meaningful. And, you know, when uh, Julie Costin and Christy were on my show the other last week talking about, you know, not only the mindset, but the heart set, the skill set. Um, and those three variables need to be considered and supported, um, but it is possible. Um, 
and it happens in lots of places. And I tell parents, if it happens in one school and one district and one state and one country, it can happen here too. Um, so it is possible. Tamara says, my son's progress reports have a lot of copy and paste from the IEP with little additional information. Is that okay? And my answer is no. <laughs> because, I mean, you know, this is like where it gets to be, you know, this is you know, we so many times we're kind of just going through the motions of like, we have to have this box on the IEP filled out. Um, and we just always put, you know, monthly this data collection reports sent home. And then the progress reports that you get sometimes are pretty meaningless, you know, P for progressing or um, NP for not progressing. I mean, that doesn't really tell you much, right? Um, and so you can ask <laughs> and you can ask that it be written in the IEP as far as what information is going to be contained in the progress report. Again, you're going to get pushback because um, these best practices are not written in the law. So people don't technically have to do them. However, if we are really here in this space talking about this child, we want to do the very best that we can. And I know we don't use the word best, the most appropriate ways. <laughs> It's really important for everyone to be on the same page. And when we are so generic in our IEPs, I mean, general ed teachers, one, probably hardly ever see the IEP. Two, does it make any sense to them? Um, so there's a whole host <laughs> of things that um, I th need to be changed. And as much as we can within the framework that we have now, um, we just try to be creative <laughs> about how we embed things in the IEP and slowly, slowly, sometimes one child at a time, which is very slow, um, we do make some changes that make a difference. Um, there are special ed directors that, you know, have come from teaching and that understand the importance of speaking up for kids and the importance of doing what we need to do to help support kids. And those special ed directors are making pretty huge changes in their districts. Um, so it's all possible. It is, it is. Um, Let's see. Yes, Tamara, um, you can just send me a private message with your email. And usually it's Tuesday mornings when my newsletter comes out and I like talk about some key takeaways from our Thursday show and also give additional resources about whatever that topic is. Through supporting each other, through sharing ideas with each other, lots of change is possible. So I'm always excited because there's more, yes, there's more to do, but that means there's more wonderful things that are going to happen. So I'm excited about that part. So if you can come back next Thursday at noon Mountain Time, and we will have more time to talk and get to know each other and see what kind of advice, answers, suggestions we all can give you. So until then, take care and I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.